second epistle of John. The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. For the truth, <coughs> excuse me, for the truth's sake which dwelleth in us, and shall be with us forever. Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father in truth and love. I rejoice greatly that I have found of thy children walking in truth, as we have received a commandment from the Father. And now I beseech thee, lady, and as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, for that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is the love this is love that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that is ye that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in them. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose no Lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. And we pick up on verse 8, number 32 of the Lessons of the Second Epistle of John. You go back and get the audios, the YouTube videos, whatever, you, how you do. 32 lessons on much we've learned on this little book of 13 verses. Again, the, the, for the young, for the newborn babe in Christ. For the one that's aged, a reminder of the scriptures, of everything we've gone through, and we're doing it slow. So we get it. And we pick up in Second John, verse 8, look to yourselves. That's how the verse starts. Who is John addressing? To the elect lady and her children and saved people. This woman we have seen is saved. Her children are saved. So this epistle is written by the Holy Spirit to us that are saved. To a woman that is saved. To her children that are saved. To the family that is saved. When the Even in the tribulation period for the Jews. For many deceivers will be present and forthcoming. The Antichrist. The Antichrist. We read about an Antichrist will deceive the world and he'll come down with forces and, and Star Wars and, and all kinds of gimmicks of, of charismatic to fool the people. And even Jesus says, even if it possible to, to the elect to fool them. The Antichrist is the deceiver. Read John 8, 44 about Satan. He uses his power allowed of God to deceive all. And I believe it's first, first or second Thessalonians that talks about this when the Holy Spirit is going to be removed and iniquity is going to work. Amazing that deceive deceive and we've done deceive I believe the last two lessons, 30 and 31, is the main focus and is the religious realm of Satan. And how many churches and occults are actively practicing deceit? When they teach anything but the way, the truth, and the life. If you are not believing the gospel, that Christ died for our sins and was buried, arose again from the grave, that he was virgin birth, that he had fulfilled the 48 prophecies of his first coming, and yet there are hundreds more of prophecies yet to be fulfilled and will be fulfilled 100%. If that is not the teaching, from the gathering, church, or synagogue, or hall, or whatever temple, or whatever you believe. If it's not the King James Bible Jesus, the creator of all, the Son of God, the God of God, Jesus is God, and God is Jesus. If it is not, 
you're being deceived. And there the Bible records there will be a day when people will not be before Jesus Christ on the right throne, will be at the great white throne of judgment and say, Lord, didn't we do this? Didn't I do this? Weren't we in your presence? And Jesus is going to say, depart from me, ye cursed. It would be not out of context to apply this today. Around this block where I live in Daytona, Florida, there are churches, and I know, I haven't been in them, but I know by Bible doctrine, they are deceiving the people that are in there. To our edification by the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 2, 11 to 14. It says, For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man, which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. The Holy Spirit, through the Bible, will give you knowledge of what is right and what is wrong. It will tell you what is devilish and what is holy. What is right and what is wrong. A simple study through the chapters and verses of the book of Proverbs will contrast that which is evil and that which is right. Man is giving an instruction manual and the problem is it's not read, even amongst Christians. They form their own lives by taking the instructions and throw them away or throw them off and then to, to build what they think it's supposed to look like and the means they're supposed to do it outside what God means. And they lose the order of step number one, A, goes into part B. And I've done that myself. I've tried to put something together without the instructions, and you got to go back. When it doesn't fit together, when there's excessive parts, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness to our prophet to be warned of deceivers a reality in any age read the life of Jezebel and her false prophet we have turned to the main focus of the second epistle of John deceivers we are going to be warned by the beloved apostle loved especially by the Lord Jesus Christ that had his ear to the heartbeat of God. And he's not going to tell us about Jesus Christ. He's going to tell us about the Antichrist. This is the same John that wrote the Gospel of John that wrote 1 John that wrote 3rd John, the 2nd John, and the revelation of Jesus Christ. The 66th book of the Bible. We are stepping out of the realm of holiness into wicked and evil and satanic for a warning. And that is what this whole book is, is written. It's a warning to this woman and her family. He says, for truth's sake, verse 2, which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. Now, with the truth's sake of God, verse 7, 8, 9, I'm going to show you what the liar's state is, John 8, 44. And let's look at John, the John that just has written this epistle. Let's go to his gospel in John 8, 44, in the words of Christ. Now, John 8, 44, you cannot find in the 
the other gospel. This is found in John's gospel. John, the writer of the, of the books that we are studying, he says in John 8, 44, the words of red Jesus Christ, my Bible is not red-lettered, but if your Bible is red-lettered Jesus Christ, this is Christ speaking. Ye are of your father the devil. You don't want him as your father. If Satan is your father, you are bound for the lake of fire. And the Bible says, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Acts 16, 30, and 31. And the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And a bold not in the truth. Really? What did John say in verse 2? For the truth's sake which dwells in us and shall be with us forever, Satan abode not in the truth. Now how can you teach that Jesus and Satan are brothers? One says we abode in the truth and one says he doesn't abide in the truth. There's an opposite. There's a contrast. There's the Proverbs. Because there is no truth in him, a deceiver. There is no truth in those churches. You will say, well, they have the same principles. Yeah, but they don't have the same Jesus Christ. So it's not the truth. Jesus said in, in John, I am the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, 6. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. You can't be half truth and you can't be half lie. Because if you don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, well, we got Jesus. You got the Jesus of the Bible, you got a Jesus that stood nailed to the cross. You got a Jesus that you eat, and the Bible says that uh, uh, cannibalism. And eating of blood is forbidden all through the Bible. You got a Jesus that visited North America upon his resurrection and said, standing at the right hand of God? Do you have a Jesus that's not God? Then that's not the truth. Listen, you can take a cake mix. And do everything that that box does to prepare that that cake mix. You throw in pepper. It's no longer a cake. Because you had put something in there that does not belong. And that's finished. <clears throat> when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar. And the father of it. That is the deceiving that we see. There are two main themes of verse 8 of 2 John. It's directed to Christians and Christian rewards. And I'm going to, this might be a real short story because I don't, I want to get into the rewards next lesson because when we get into the rewards, we're going to get to the judgment seat of Christ. And that's going to be a long study. And then we're going to pick ourselves back up in John chapter 8. So John chapter 8, we're going to be here for a while. 7 pages of this book. And here we come to a very important event in a Christ life. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought but that we receive a full reward. I'm going to close. Because that's the next lesson. But John is not a deceiver. The Holy Spirit has put this in here for our learning. I was, uh, I was supposed, I was supposed, yeah, I can't get the word out, that John has written more letters in his life. 
then three. And yet three are recorded in the Bible. First John, second John, third John. We're studying second John. Of all the letters that John has written, we contain verse eight. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we had wrought, but that we receive a full reward. And let me give you a preview for next week. Like I said, it's going to be many lessons next week, next time. You cannot lose your soul. Now, if you believe you can lose your soul, you are wrong, and that's not today's study. You are wrong. You need to get in the Word of God. You need to get on your knees. You need to get the assurance. Because John writes to us, These things have I written unto you, the previous epistle, that you may know you have eternal life. And you go read the words of the Gospel of John. How Jesus said, None can pluck them out of my Father's hand. I lost none but the son of perdition. You're not the son of perdition. But John writes to us a true fact. That you cannot lose your soul, but you can lose rewards. And rewards are obtainable for Christians. And you fall into the category which I have as a loser of a Christian. And you may think, oh, don't call people losers. That we lose not. If you re lose the rewards that God has given you, you are a loser. Second John 8. If you're saved, and you have done things for Christ, and you have fallen away, you don't go to church, you don't read your Bible, you get mixed up in these occults we're going to look at, you just don't do nothing for Christ, you are a loser. I'll read again. Look to yourself that you lose not those things which you have wrought. And we're going to study the loser... And we're going to study the winner because it says, but that we receive a full reward. John is going to teach us and we're going to look at our rewards given to us by Jesus Christ. Separate from salvation. Salvation is not even on the plane that we're talking about. We're talking about rewards. And you can obtain reward, and according to John, who wrote the gospel, wrote three epistles, and God is entrusted with the testimony and the revelation of Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, you can lose what you reward. And we're going to look at the judgment seat of Christ next time. That we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. And I am not talking to no lost man. Don't you jump on this bandwagon if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. The reward you will get for not trusting Christ as your Savior is a lake of fire. That's the reward you're going to get. I am talking to blood wash, those that put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And not just say this little prayer and on and on. You are born again of the Spirit. You have been adopted into God's family by the Spirit and by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are saved. This next study will be for you. Of a great importance. I might stress this over and over in these lessons. A Christian cannot lose their salvation of their soul. John 3.18. I'm going to trust you to go read these yourself. John 5.24.
and John 10 28 John 3 16 1st John 5 13 John 20 31 write these down rewind write them down and look them up and study to show thyself approved unto God a man that needs not to be ashamed rightly divine the word of truth don't be ashamed at the judgment seat of Christ if you've seen those things that you have wrought in Christ lost. Demas lost it all. Mark lost it all, but according to Paul, gained more. John 20, well, let me go through this list again. Write them down. You don't have a pencil? Rewind. Stop. Pause. I'm going to give you scriptures. Write them down. Pause. Now. Please. Write them down. Look them up. John 3.18. John 5.24. John 10.28. John 3.16. 1 John 5.13. John 20 verse 31. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Ephesians 1.13. Romans 8, 38 and 39. John 6, 47. John, uh, John 6, 47 and verse 40. John 3, 36 and John 1, 12. If there is anything you in life you cannot lose, it is your salvation. It is not yours to be lost. It's God's. And you think God loses anything? Listen, he doesn't lose a hell-bound sinner. The hell-bound sinner rejected God's offer. And you cannot apply this verse about your soul. If you are taught by this verse, if a man out of pulpit, if a man sit in a chair, if a man in your living room, if somebody has come across your life and to use this verse to say it is your soul. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is coming to flesh. This is a deceiver and antichrist. If you're being taught this out of a church somewhere, a temple, or whatever, you need to get down on your knees and find a Bible-believing church and meet with that pastor and and, and, and meet with the Lord. Because there's two possibilities. You are just out calling God a liar. Or the sad fact is, possibly number two, maybe you're not saved. You may not have it. Or number three, you're just not putting assurance in God. All three are wrong. But next week, we'll pick up a fair good study that I've liked. I have taught this, this, this lesson many a time. I have taught this lesson among my family. I have taught it in the, in the prison ministry. I have taught it in a Sunday school. And now I'm going to bring it to you on YouTube and, and audio. Or your MP3 players or wherever you, you use my voice. Of the Word of God. And please get these videos out. Get these links out. There's no copyright. And if you follow my messages, if you overtake what I say, cut and slice, that's between you and God. You know, they lied to Jesus. They found false witnesses for Jesus. There was false witnesses of Paul. And there are going to be people out there going to take these videos and they're going to cut and slice. And I may end up in jail, but the Lord knows what I've said. I'm giving you all right right now, all permission of all my videos. As of November 17, 2014, get them out. Get them out to the glory and honor of the Lord Jesus Christ. Please. Let the knowledge that God has given me be useful throughout the whole world. Translate them. Do whatever you need for the honor and glory of God. I give you complete permission. But Christian. Next week, if you never heard, next time, 
next video. It may not be next week. You might listen to these right three days, four days, right in a row. For me, hopefully next week, Lord willing. If you've never heard the judgment seat of Christ, you need to listen. You need to hear. Something wonderful is going to happen. Even if you've heard about the judgment seat of Christ, refresh your life to realize you will stand, you will kneel before Jesus Christ again one day. You see, what do you mean again? Well, at the rapture, aren't we going to be before Jesus Christ? Aren't we going to meet him in the air? And right after the rapture, I believe the judgment seat of Christ takes place. And a little misconception, if anybody uh, uh, came to my attention the other day, and I've said that the judgment seat of Christ is going to be the, and I may say it through here, and hopefully I'll change myself, because I could be wrong. The judgment seat of Christ, I've always said, is the seven years of the tribulation period. And I could be wrong. Because it came to my knowledge the other day, and let me put this out there, if anybody's heard me, I'm wrong. The Bible does not say the tribulation happens right after the rapture. It could be five, ten years later, the seven years of tribulation will happen. I don't know. If it happens right after we're gone in the rapture, or it takes time, I don't know. So I cannot say that the, that the judgment seat of Christ is going to be seven years. I guess I can say it's going to be a minimum of seven years. Because we're coming back at the end of the seven years on, on horseback behind our King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So let me get that out there. I, I, uh, the military term is I stand corrected. It means I, I, I was wrong. And I apologize. And I, I ask the Lord to forgive me. And to put that under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you, you take lesson number 33. And how many lessons it will be about the judgment seat of Christ for Christians. And, and hopefully it will get you out there to do something for the Lord. I've, I've got time. Let me tell you the wonderful work of the Lord. And I'll close. Because it has to do with the judgment seat of Christ. Rewards that God will, will give to me if I remain faithful. I hope I don't ever lose them. I hope I receive the full reward coming to me. The work of the Lord is not only will he give you crowns. We'll, we'll read about and study next time. Through these ministries, Second John, bringing my family and you through the chapters of the Bible, which we are now in Proverbs, the study of the Gospel of Luke, and any other lectures that the Lord brings to me and I give to you on Facebook and, and the audio that you can use. I know of a certainty that these messages Though I sit here in my living room in Daytona Beach, Florida, are in Europe, I know that for a certainty. I don't know where else they are in this world. I am a missionary in Europe, and I'm still sitting here in America. And reaping rewards. I'll tell you something that God has happened in the last two weeks. And Lord willing this weekend to come. And I don't know what's going to happen. May the rapture happen. May I be dead or unable to speak or unable to see. I ask you to pray like for my eyes. They're, they're getting cloudy. We have had the last two weeks. And I'm not boasting. This is not what the right hand and left hand. I'm telling you what God has done. My family on the street ministry with tracts, with signs, and preaching. And I'm not going to give the complete full list because it's just, I have witnessed to Mexicans. I have witnessed to Russians. Albanians, if that's what they're called, and I forgive them not, if that's not. Turkish. Luthienians. I didn't say in that country wrong, but whatever they call themselves. 
Uh, and there's just so many I can't even think. My wife is naming some off as we're going along. From Daytona Beach, God, His faithfulness in His Word has brought the mission field to me. I have not even had to learn a language. That's a reward in itself that not only am I going to get a reward at the judgment seat of Christ, but His Word is getting out. His Word is wonderful and His work is in my life. is like, wow. And I'm going to say something. I'll say it off the camera to my wife because I know some people will run to Acts 2 and we're going to be careful there, but in Acts chapter 2, I guess I'll say it. Peter preached a whole group of people that came from different nations. They came to Peter. And the Lord has done that in my life. He's brought these people to me where nowhere in time I could have reached them. The rewards of God are... You know... I'm trying to think of the saying. You put your life in deposit to God and wait to see how much of a great interest He puts in you. You give to God in a deposit and the interest that He'll give back to you and I'm talking about the here on this earth. And I'm not talking about give God ten dollars and you get ten thousand. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about the blessings and glories and mercifulness and the peacefulness that He gives in your life and the great wow. Wait till you stand before and then kneel before Jesus Christ, the judgment seat of Christ, and you're doing what you're trying to do what He tells you to do. Now, there's nothing worth serving the Lord. Think about this. Those hands that will be pierced for eternity, the Bible says. One of the minor prophets says, you know, what are those wounds in your hands? Those hands will be pierced. His feet will be pierced. His side. Listen, Jesus went up to Thomas and said, go ahead, poke your finger through. They're there. Imagine those nailed, pierced hands holding a crown to put it upon your head. To hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. If that is not worth it, what is? If that does not lead you to say, I'm going to take a stand for Christ today. What will? Grab five gospel tracks and just put five tracks out for the week. Next time you go to church after you do that, grab ten and put ten out. And go up to somebody and tell them how you got saved. That's what happened in my life. I got saved on a Saturday afternoon, my grandma's house, April 14th, 1987. April 1987. That date. I know April 97, April 1987, 773 Broad Street Extension, Waterford, Connecticut. I was saved. Joe Caswell led me through the Bible to how to be saved. I knelt that a great altar. My grandma's coffee table. I went to church Sunday and made a public profession that I had received Christ as my Savior. I went home that afternoon, that Sunday afternoon, and told my first person, my father, my dad, about Jesus. I went the following Sunday and got baptized. That Wednesday, I went with the pastor Wednesday night 
Well, that Wednesday was church. I went during that week. I forget what day it was now. Knocking on doors. I stand affirm today. I preach on the street. I get tracks out. Because the Lord has guided me. I can tell you at the corner of Main Street, and I forget the name of the road in Norwich, right there in front of the job service, I can tell you how much of an idiot I felt to open up my, first, my mouth for the first time in the street preach. I felt like an idiot. I felt like I was going to pack it up and just go home because it's not going to work. There was nobody there to hear me. I'm going home. I have felt, and I have been exactly where you have been. I have taken people who have lived as Christians and had no idea what Christianity is and brought them to know what it is to serve the Lord and do right. That fear, that... Everybody gets it. I get it. There are times right now in 2014, I'll be downtown and, and the Lord will say, Open your big mouth. I'll walk away and not preach at all. Because of fear. I lost the reward. You don't have to preach. Gospel tracts. And they're dying out from the churches. Baptist churches have gotten rid of gospel tracts. And that is the simplest way. Christian, get these video and audios out. Be ready for the next lesson. And it may be your afternoon, it may be your next day. Lord willing, next week for me. I seem to forget to do Second John. It just, sometimes it goes weeks without doing it, and then I feel bad. But be ready. And be ready in prayer now for the next lesson. Not for me, even though I need it. But maybe for you to say, you know what? I want to hear about the judgment seat of Christ, Lord. I want rewards. I want to be prepared to hear that, with me that message, that lesson. And, Lord, I want to prepare my heart to, to go and do something for you. And Lord, maybe even before I hear the message, maybe to go out and do something for you, Lord, even before the message. And we don't know. The Lord tarries. Maybe the Lord will come before the message comes. Start today. Be a witness for Jesus Christ. A little prayer goes a long way.